For Bloomsday 2021, NCBI and the James Joyce Cultural Centre have joined forces to celebrate James Joyce as a visually impaired artist. Through a series of videos, we show the connections between the Joyce family and the NCBI's headquarters here in Drumcondra, which was the former Fever Hospital. Chapter 3 from Ulysses by James Joyce Proteus Stephen Dedalus is walking on Sandyman Strand. It's 11 o'clock in the morning. Ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that if no more, thought through my eyes. Signatures of all things I am here to read, sea spawn and sea rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot. Snot green, blue silver, rust, coloured signs, limits of the diaphane, but he adds, in bodies. Then he was aware of them bodies before them coloured. How? By knocking his sconce against them, sure. Go easy. Bald he was, and a millionaire. Maestro di color che sano. Limit of the diaphane in. Why in? Diaphane, add diaphane. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate. If not, a door. Shut your eyes and see. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush crackling rack and shells. You are walking through it howsomever. I am, a stride at a time, a very short space of time through very short times of space. Five, six, the knock I nander. Exactly. And that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. Open your eyes. No! Jesus! If I fell over a cliff that beetles o'er his base, fell through the nay benign and ineluctably, I am getting on nicely in the dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Tap with it. They do. My two feet in his boots are at the end of his legs. Naben ein ander. Sounds solid. Made by the mallet of Los Demiurgos. Am I walking into eternity on Sandy Mount Strand? Crush. Crack. Crick. Crick. Wild sea money. Domini DC Kenzema. Won't you come to Sandy Mount, Madeline the Mare? Rhythm begins, you see. I hear. A cataleptic tetrameter of I am's marching. No, a gallop. Dillin the Mare. Open your eyes now. I will. One moment. Has all vanished since. If I open and am forever in the black a diaphane, basta. I will see if I can see. See now. There all the time without you. And ever shall be. World without end. This is an extract from James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It's an episode in which Stephen is walking around Cork uh, with his father. Stephen walked on at his father's side, listening to stories he'd heard before, hearing again the names of the scattered and dead revellers who had been the companions of his father's youth. 
and a faint sickness sighed in his heart. He recalled his own equivocal position in Belvedere, a free boy, a leader afraid of his own authority, proud and sensitive and suspicious, battling against the squalor of his life and against the riot of his mind. The letters, cut in the stained wood of the desk, stared upon him, mocking his bodily weakness and futile enthusiasms and making him loathe himself for his own mad and filthy orgies. The spittle in his throat grew bitter and foul to swallow, and the faint sickness climbed to his brain so that for a moment he closed his eyes and walked on in darkness. He could still hear his father's voice. When you kick out for yourself, Stephen, as I dare say you will one of these days, remember whatever you do to mix with gentlemen. When I was a young fellow, I tell you where I enjoyed myself. I mixed with fine, decent fellows. Every one of us could do something. One fellow had a good voice. Another fellow was a good actor. Another could sing a good comic song. Another was a good oarsman or a good racket player. Another could tell a good story and so on. We kept the ball rolling anyhow and enjoyed ourselves and saw a bit of life and we were none the worse of it either. But we were all gentlemen, Stephen, at least I hope we were, and bloody good, honest Irish men too. That's the kind of fellows I want you to associate with. Fellows of the right kidney. I'm talking to you as a friend, Stephen. I don't believe a son should be afraid of his father. No, I treat you as your grandfather treated me when I was a young chap. We were more like brothers than father and son. i never forget the first day he caught me smoking. I was standing at the end of the South Terrace one day with some man like myself and she we thought we were grandfellas because we had pipes stuck in the corners of our mouths. Suddenly, the governor passed. He didn't say a word or stop even. But the next day, Sunday, we were out for a walk together and when we were coming home, he took out his cigar case and said, uh, by the by, Stephen, I didn't know you smoked or something like that. Of course, I tried to carry it off as best I could. If you want a good smoke, he said, try one of these cigars. An American captain made me a present of them last night in Queenstown. Stephen heard his father's voice break into a laugh which was almost a sob. He was the handsomest man in Cork at that time. By God, he was. The woman used to stand to look after him in the street. He heard the sob passing loudly down his father's throat and opened his eyes with a nervous impulse. The sunlight, breaking suddenly on his sight, turned the sky and clouds into a fantastic world of sombre masses with lake-like spaces of dark, rosy light. His very brain was sick and powerless. He could scarcely interpret the letters of the signboards of the shops. By his monstrous way of life, he seemed to have put himself beyond the limits of reality. Nothing moved him or spoke to him from the real world unless he heard in it an echo of the infuriated cries within him. He could respond to no earthly or human appeal, dumb and insensible to the call of summer and gladness and companionship, wearied and dejected by his father's voice. He could scarcely recognise his own thoughts and repeated slowly to himself, I am Stephen Dedalus. I am walking beside my father, whose name is Simon Dedalus. We are in Cork, in Ireland. Cork is a city. Our room is in the Victoria Hotel. Victoria and Stephen and Simon. Simon and Stephen and Victoria. Name. John Joyce, the father progenitor of both Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, imbued both works with his presence and his vocabulary. His origins by that Cork Blind Asylum, which later became St Monica's Trust and subsequently NCBI, comes by a strange commodious ficus of recirculation to his end here in Withwood Road. He was not the first Joyce to have associated with the hospital. 
On Sunday, October the 2nd, 1904, his son Stanislaus stood across there on the canal and records that a nurse is playing with a black dog in the grounds of Drumcondra Hospital. I can see she is pretty and young. I would like to be near her. Let us pass into Ulysses and the wake and encounter John, Stroke, Bloom, Stroke Simon Dedalus as he parses the instances and associations of blindness in those Dublin streets. In the Hades episode, the industrious blind, why, some reason. He refers here to the Richmond Institute for the Industrious Blind, 1810 to 1957, at 42 Upper O'Connell Street, from whom NCBI inherited the Home Patrick Cup golf competition, and which NCBI's founder, Alice Stanley Armitage, visited in 1931. Many of its outworkers were supported by NCBI. The Stone Cutters Yard on the right. This business was commenced by the Carmelite brothers at St Joseph's First School for the Male Blind at their initial address at Prospect, just up the road from here. In Estragonians, Bloom meets a blind piano tuner wishing to cross Dawson Street to Molswood Street and South Frederick Street. Number 11 Molswood Street was NCBI's third address from December 1938 to October 1969. Number 22 South Frederick Street was the last address of Miss Pettigrew's School for the Blind and her library was also situated there. It commenced in 26 Marlborough Street in Dublin in 1857, the oldest library for the blind in the British Isles. The blind piano tuner again appears in the Sirens, Circe and Ithaca episodes. In Molswood Street, Bloom sees the advertisement for the Mirrors Bazaar in aid of Mercer's Hospital. Some Condor Hospital also held a number of fundraising bazaars for some years. Joyce would have been aware of this. In 1907, the Drum fate at the hospital grounds raised £567. In 1911, the Big Drum Bazaar held at the Rotunda raised £1,110. In Finnegan's Wake, a stiff, steaded rake and good Varian's muck for Kate the Cleaner. This is a reference to Varian's brush factory at 96 Talbot Street. Often in stiff competition with the Richmond Blind Institute's brush making department. Amos and Alexander Varian and other members of that Cork Dublin family were leading advocates for blind people in Dublin and Cork. May Varian, Nee Alman, who married Alexander Varian, was one of the leading lights in the Cork Blind Asylum. Before she moved to Dublin on her marriage, in Dublin, along with William Rochford Wade, they formed the Hibernian Blind Society at 66 Lower Garden Street and later the William Watchford Raid Hostel for Blind Women at 22 Blackhall Place, the founding meeting of which was held at the Varian Brushworks. This hostel was later taken over by NCBI. John Joyce spent his last years as a lodger with the Metcalf family at 25 Clive Road, around the corner from here. It was Bertie Metcalf, the youngest member of the family, who on December the 22nd, 1931, informed James Joyce in Paris and his sister Eileen in Dublin of his lodger's final illness. John was estranged from his other living children. William Metcalf and his family had originally lived at 38 Whitwood Road and moved sometime around 1913 to Claude Road. During John's last illness, it was William Metcalf, Bertie's father, who brought John's pipe and book to the hospital, followed by their dog, Boxer. John was pleased with his canine visit. It reminded him of his faithful dog, Jack, from his early days in Cork, who used to follow him into Queen's University. And still today, guide dogs from Cork visit the offices of NCBI. Eileen was the only Joyce to visit him. She made his funeral arrangements. He was carried out in the coffin of plain Elam. Ironic since the lands adjoining the hospital down to St Bridget's Road had been known as Elam Lodge. James Joyce would have liked this. For Elam is mentioned 15 times in the wake. In one section James Joyce seeks again the tales of the progenitor father of his life's works. I feel as old as yonder Elam. Tell me of John or Sean, who were Shem and Sean, the living sons or daughters of? Night now, tell me, tell me, tell me, Alan. Extract from a portrait made of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. He saw the rector or sitting at a, at a desk writing. 
there was a, a skull on the desk and as strange in solemn smell in the room like the old leather of chairs his heart was beating f fast on account of the so solemn place he was in in and the silence of the room and he looked at the skull and at the rector's his kind looking face well my little man said the rector or what is it stephen in swallowed down the thing in his throat and said I broke my glasses, sir. The rector opened his mouth and said, Oh. Then and he smiled and said, Well, if we broke our glasses, we must write home for a new pair. I wrote home, sir, said Stephen, and, and Father Arnold said I am not to study till they come. Quite right, said the rector. Stephen and swallowed down the thing again and tried to keep his his legs and his voice from from shaking but sir yes father dolan in came in today and hit me because i was not writing my theme the rector looked at him in silence and and he could feel the uh, bl blood rising to his face and the tears about to rise to his to his eyes the rector said your name is Daedalus, isn't it? Yes, sir. And where did you break your glasses? On the cinder path, sir. A fellow was, was coming out of the bicycle house and I and I I fell and they and they got broken. I don't know how the fellow's was name. The rector looked at him again in silence. Then he, then he smiled and said, Oh, well, it was a mistake. I am, I am sure. Father Dolan did not know. But I I told him I broke them, sir, and he hit me. Did you tell him that you had written home for a new pair? Or the rector asked. No, sir. Oh, well then, said the rector. Father Dolan did not understand. You can say that I excuse you from your lessons for...
for a few days. In the bar of the Ormond Hotel, Simon Dedalus is having a chat with the barmaid, Mina, over the counter. I see you have moved the piano. The man was in today, Miss Deuce replied, tuning it for the Smokers concert. And I never heard such an exquisite player. Is that a fact? Didn't he, Miss Kennedy? The real classical, you know? And blind too, poor fella. Not even 20, I'm sure he was. Is that a fact? Mr. Dedalus said, and he drank and strayed away. So sad to look at his face, Miss Deuce replied. Miss Deuce concluded. Tap, tap. Piano again. Sounds better than last time I heard it. Tuned, probably. Stopped again. Cowley and Dollard still urged the lingering singer out with it. With it, Simon. It, Simon. Ladies and gentlemen, I am most deeply obliged by your kind solicitations. It, Simon. I have no money, but if you will lend me your attention, I will endeavour to sing to you of a heart bowed down. By the sandwich bell, in screening shadow, Lydia, her bronze and gold, a lady's grace gave and withheld, as in cool glaucous O'Donnell. Mina, two tankards to her pinnacle's gold. The harping chord of prelude closed, a chord long drawn expectant drew a voice away. When first I saw that form endearing, brain tipped, cheek touched with flame, they listened, feeling that flow, endearing flow over skin, limb, human heart, soul, spine. Bloom signed to the waiter, bald pat as a waiter, hard of hearing, to Set a jar at the door of the bar. The door of the bar. So, that will do. Pat, waiter, waited, waiting to hear, for he was hard of hear by the door. To me. Siopold, consumed, come well sung, all clapped. She ought to come. To me, to him, to her, you too, me, us. Bravo! Clap, clap. Good man, Simon. Bravo! Clappy, clap, clap. Encore. Clap, clip, clap. Sound as a bell. Bravo, Simon. Clap, clap, clap. Encore. And clapped, said, cried, clapped all. Ben Dollard, Lydia Deuce, George Lidwell, Pat, Mina. Two gentlemen with two tankards, Cowley, one gent with tank, and bronze Miss Deuce and gold Miss Mina. Tap, 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 tap. Tap, 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 tap. A blind stripling stood in the door. He saw not bronze, he saw not gold, nor Ben, nor Bob, nor Tom, nor Cy. Nor George, nor Tanks, nor Richie, nor Pat. He, 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 he did not see. As Simon said in the uh, episode Sirens, ladies and gentlemen, I am deeply obliged to you for your kind solicitations. I am going to close with the song, which is the only known song uh, for which uh, Joyce wrote both the words and the music. 
So I will bid you adieu with this song. Bid adieu, adieu. Adieu, adieu. 